And let me go over these two announcements again. I hope I've done these for this class. How are the college transfer day coming up in February? Did I? No? Let me make sure I do this then. The Lawson State Community College is having a college transfer fair day, two of them in fact. Uh, one is going to be Wednesday, February 12th, so it's still a couple weeks off. 9.30 to 11.30 in the morning on the Birmingham West Campus in the academic building, which is B Hall. And uh, then on Thursday, February the 13th, on this campus, in this building, uh, they say in the campus cafeteria, but I think it's probably going to be in the faculty staff dining room, which is next door to the campus cafeteria. They may spill over into the cafeteria, but it just seems like that's the end of breakfast, the beginning of lunch, and uh, I don't see how they can fit in the campus cafeteria. But anyway, that's 9.30 to 11.30, Thursday, February 13th. Here are some of the institutions who have been invited to attend. No guarantee they all show up, but here are the ones who have been invited. AUM, Mississippi State, University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, University of Montevallo, Alabama State University, Alabama A&M University, University of West Georgia, Auburn University, Jacksonville State University, Stillman College, William Carey University, uh, University of UAB, UAH, University of West Alabama, Troy University, University of South Alabama, University of Alabama College of Continuing Studies, so not just UA, but also their College of Continuing Studies. They'll probably have two tables. Athens State University, uh, UAB has a table, but also the School of Health Professions will have a table. If they let you out. University of North Alabama, Sanford University, Alcorn State University, Kentucky State University, Tennessee State University, Faulkner University, Southeastern Bible College, Talladega College, and Georgia Southwestern State University. Quite a few. Now, maybe they all won't show up, and they may not be here for both days, but you can uh, check with the our uh, career services department as it gets closer to see how many of those are going to be here if you are interested in talking with those. Now, this is something especially geared to people like you. So, listen up on this one. I'm not going to read it all, but this is from a Mr. Joseph Muskin. He runs a summer research program for the Center for Power Optimization of Electrothermal Systems. The acronym for that is POETS, okay? <laughs> Who would have thought it, okay? They're looking to recruit minority engineering students to work at three of our four institutions this summer. Those are the University of Illinois, University of Arkansas, and Howard University. This 10-week internship exposes undergraduate students to academic research in the fields of mechanical, electrical, and material engineering. So if you're in any one of those three or any related field, consider it. Okay? Yes? A little out of it. Can we take a picture of it? Yeah, absolutely. Right after class, come by and get a picture of it. Now, catch this. This is a fantastic learning opportunity. And guess what? They pay you $5,000 to do it. Okay? That's $500 a week. Okay? To go and learn. Not just that, you receive free housing while you're there. Okay? And usually the housing comes with a meal plan. So they'll feed you for two, 10 weeks. Okay? Boy, well, that's a cost. Okay? Now, they also provide free airfare there and back once. You don't get to come home every weekend. On, that's on your dollar, okay? But they'll pay you to get there at the beginning and your airfare home, okay? So uh, they will provide that for you. And you gain access to weekly professional development seminars as well as other events, uh, benefits, and they have all sorts of uh, more information here. Now, catch this. The application deadline is February 15th. So that's 
about three weeks away. Okay, so uh, there's plenty more information here. There's a little brochure. Uh, I printed it on my printer, so it didn't do a great job. The front and back, you can get much by anything you want to know from that. And at least if you can't figure out everything you need to know, you can get uh, sites, locations to, uh, to answer any questions you may not have had. Found in the hallway this morning a pretty nice mechanical pencil. Uh, someone had dropped it. If it's any of yours, it's here. Uh, have yourself. All right. Now, let's set up slides from current slide. Well, I'm going to try to anyway. Nothing seems to be working. The system seemed very, very slow today, but it's now working. First, I want to know any questions from anything we've covered so far. All right. Now, we had done example one in section 2.2. .2. Uh, we hadn't done example two, uh, but we haven't gotten to the limits that failed to exist. So I'm going to back up. Thought I'd back up. Well, let's see. Looks like the, probably the best place to do example two. Okay. Whoops. Let me get my pen set up. Okay. All right. If no questions, example two, finding a limit. Here is a function. F of x is equal to, and it's a piecewise defined function. It's equal to 1 whenever x is not equal to 2. It's 0 when x is equal to 2. What a strange function, OK? Now it says find the limit as x approaches 2. Now we have a, yeah, we have, OK. What we're looking for is limit as x approaches 2 of this function, f of x. I'm not going to write it all again, but there it is. What is the limit as x approaches 2? Now, we want to do that from the left and from the right. Okay? So as x approaches 2 from the left, what is its value? Not at 2, but as it approaches 2 from the left. One, exactly. Anytime x is not equal to 2, it's, approach, it's uh, coming in at 1. How about is the limit as x approaches 2 from the right? One. It's also 1, okay? But at 2, it's not 1. It's 0, okay? So here's an example of a function whose limit exists from both directions, but it's not equal to that value, okay, at that at that value. So this one, you couldn't plug it in, okay? This would be 1, okay, from both directions. Does that make sense? Okay? Any questions? All right. The fact that f at 2 is equal to 0 has no bearing on the existence or value of the limit as it approaches 2, okay? Um, if we had a second function here, g of x equal to another piecewise defined function, 1 is x is not equal to 2, and 2 if x is equal to 2, what's its limit as g of x as x approaches 2? I think it is. They didn't say that, but I'll x approaches 2. That's a pretty ugly g of x, isn't it? Don't be agreeing with me too much. Okay. And that's also equal to 1. Even though the values at 2 are very different. Who cares? The limit as x approaches 2 is 1 from both sides of both functions. So, so far in this section you have been estimating limits numerically and graphically. Okay, numerically is when you plug in values, you plug in, get closer and closer to the value. Graphically is when you draw a graph. Okay, um, 
Each of these uh, produces an estimate of a limit. In section 2.3, which is the next one, uh, you'll develop study analytic techniques for evaluating limits. Now, I've cheated and told you a few of those, okay? Because to me, that's a lot more sense, okay? And that's using algebra or calculus to uh, estimate a limit or evaluate a limit, in fact. And it says, throughout the course, try to develop the habit of using the three-prong approach. Yeah, it's okay, but I like analytic best. Okay. So let's move on to any questions, example one or two. All right, now we're at the top of page 74, limits that fail to exist. All right. It says here, show that the limit as x approaches 0 of absolute value of x divided by x does not exist. Okay? Now, first, <clears throat> to me, this one probably is most easily done, not analytically, but graphically. Uh, I want to say that, any, or it may be numerically would be fine too. Uh, okay, is it the manual? Okay, all right, got you down. Okay, welcome to the class. And since this is Germanuel's first day here, let me go through just a few things for his benefit to, so he'll know how to sort of catch up, even though this is only the third class. If this was a Tuesday, Thursday class, this would either be the fourth or the fifth class. But the way they started the term, uh, Monday, Wednesday classes are way behind. Okay. Now, have you gotten on the new blackboard? Okay. Fairly confident with that. Okay, so in the same way. Okay, have you seen this this course on the new blackboard? Okay. When you go to this course in the new blackboard, hopefully you'll see uh, sort of the first entry there. They don't have the tabs reach out like they used to. You just see basically the whole course over on the right, at least on the instructor side. First thing you see hopefully will be <coughs> the syllabus. Okay. I think I've updated and, and all the syllabus should be correct now. If you click on that, it brings up, or at least on the instructor side, it just shows you the syllabus file. In the old blackboard, it would have opened the syllabus just like that. So when that brings up, if you click on that, nothing happens. So there's three dots over here on the right hand side. If you click on those, you'll see download the file. If you click on that, the file will download. The instructor side, it takes a while sometimes, but it will download. Okay, that's true for all the entries here that are documents, except one. Okay, the next one is the locator card that shows when I'm in class, out of class, when I'm uh, uh, on campus, off campus, which campus I'm on, what classes I'm in, when. Okay. Now that's sort of a good one to look at. That information is also pretty much in the syllabus, but it's laid out in you know, a, a grid on, on my locator card. It's the same thing with touched on the door. Just realized I have class falls on my door now. I need to uh, move over to the new one. Okay? Uh, so that's there. The next file is the research paper file. Okay. Read that because that has some information you need to know now. So you can be working on that. Okay, and these are all files that you have to click on the three dots to get them to open. Okay. Now I can't remember next exactly what shows up, but I'll give them in some sort of order here. Somewhere there will be the uh, PowerPoints. So all the PowerPoints that we could possibly do in this course, in this term, this course, this term will be there. We probably won't get to them all, but I'll put them all out there. Okay? Also somewhere there is a 
And, that, and that's all. Okay. Now that in the PowerPoint, that's a folder. Now on the folder files, you go over to the right hand side and there's either an up arrow or a down arrow. I don't remember which. But if you click on the arrow, then it opens the folder and you see all these PowerPoints. Okay. Now, somewhere in the mix there, you will see a link, a web link, and that's the uh, YouTube videos, Math 125 YouTube videos. Okay. Now, if you open that, and if you click on that, it opens automatically. No three dots or anything, it just it opens. It takes a few seconds or so, but it will open. And what you see then are a bunch of files at the top of things we haven't done. Okay? But if you go to the bottom, you'll have to scroll down to get there, but when you get to the bottom, the first one that says syllabus, that's the one we did last Monday. Okay? Not the day before yesterday, but last week, Monday week. Okay, and then the next one will be what we did on Wednesday. And then we didn't have class on Monday because of Martin Luther King Day. So then when you're looking at it, the day will be further down. Uh, what I've done, what I do is when I do a new file down here for this class, I take out the old ones up top, you know, from the previous term. So those are all old ones up there. The reason they hang in there is sometimes systems fail. And if they do, I don't have, yeah. There'll be something there you can look at. Now let me tell you this too, and I hope all of you caught it too. Those older files are from the another uh, book. It was uh, same authors, both authors are the same, but the chapter numbering is different, and uh, this chapter, the title is the same, uh, and it'll be pretty close to the same thing, but starting with the next chapter, there'll be little differences because this book incorporates the early transcendental functions in the text in differentiation and integration, whereas the previous book that we used had a separate chapter for extra, uh, 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 ex uh, early transcendental functions. So that would be the major differences you'll see between what you see in the old ones and this. So I'll try to hit the files, but I may delete the wrong one or something because uh, those are going to be hard to, to, to tear up. Okay, then after that, there are several other web links that I found or students have found that said they found useful for the course. You can look at them if you want to. They're just out there for your uh, benefit if they're helpful to you. Okay, now. Can't think of anything else that would be there that, that we need to talk about. Well, the reason I brought this up, if you go down to those, especially the first two, the one that's title is syllabus, and then the next one there's something or another about section two point something, two point one probably. Those you'll see and hear everything we did in class. Going through the syllabus, going through my locator card, going through the uh uh research paper, you'll hear me talk about it as well as this. Because what I'm doing, this right here is indicating I'm recording the class. Okay? Everything that I say and that's projected on the board, my arm waving doesn't get picked up, but anything that's projected on the board and uh, that I say is recorded in sync. Now, it takes a while for it to look. For instance, this class now probably won't load until around 7 this evening. I mean, it'll load the YouTube video sooner, but I don't have a break to move it to the playlist. Okay, so, and that, on, in Blackboard, that, that links you to the playlist. Okay. All right, any questions, anybody? Corrections, things that you found useful, I've left off. All right, we're on example three on page, uh, in chapter two, limits and their properties, uh, page 74. Example three. We need to show that this limit does not exist. Now, I wish they hadn't told you that. I wish they had just said, evaluate the limit. And then you would find that it doesn't exist. Now, I guess I sort of gave it away. How would you like to do it? Remember, we have three techniques. Numerical, 
uh, graphical and analytical. How would you like to approach it? Say again? Analytical. Analytical. Okay. Now, if we're doing an analytical, here's what I suggest that you do. First thing we need to do is figure out what this function right here is doing. Uh, how do we find define the absolute value of x? That's a piecewise defined function, by the way. Anyone know what those pieces are? Okay, no, it would be x for certain values. For x greater than or equal to zero. Isn't that right? Give me an x. One. What's the absolute value of one? One. Okay. X. One is greater than or equal to zero. So that's, and its value is one. Give me another x. Two. What's the absolute value of two? Two. Okay, yeah, two is greater than or equal to zero. Its value is two. Give me another x. Okay, I think we got the positive ones down, okay? Oh, let's do negative one. What's the absolute value of negative one? Oh, but that's not negative one. That's the opposite of negative one. So it would be negative x anytime x is less than zero. Is that not right? Yay or nay? All right. Now, so now we know what that top function is. It, it's a uh, piecewise defined function. So let's now consider this function, absolute value of x over x. Okay? And let's consider this as a piecewise defined function. Okay, I'm doing too much here. Okay. Now, what you want to do first? Positive x's or negative x's? Positive x's. Okay? So in positive x, absolute value of x is x, and x over x is 1. Okay? So this will be 1 for any value x greater than or equal. Let's do greater than 0. Okay? Anyone want to hazard a guess of why I left off equal to 0? Okay, it's not positive, you're right. There'll be another one, but let's go on. Okay, what you want to do next? Less than 0 or 0? Less than 0, so let's do. What is the value when uh, absolute value of x is less than 0? Well, then that's a minus x over x, and what's that value? Say that again. Negative 1. That's for any x less than 0. Okay? Now, we've left off the middle thing here. That's where x equals 0. What do we have then? Really? Not quite. Indeterminate. Remember, when you have 0 over 0, we don't know. So this is indeterminate. I can't write it all in there, so it's indeterminate. Because you have 0 over 0. Now, in the old days, you're absolutely right. We would have said does not exist because you can't divide by 0. But now that we're talking about limits, especially, if you have a form that's 0 over 0, we don't know what it's doing. And that's what we're investigating. Okay? Now, <clears throat> this is doing it sort of analytically. As x is approaching 0 from the left-hand side that's down here, what is the value of this function? Negative 1. If it's approaching 0 from the positive side, what's this value? Positive 1, and we don't know what it is at 0. You think that limit exists? No. It's one value here, another value there, and an unknown value in the middle. The unknown value in the middle doesn't bother us much, but the fact that these two 
come up to different numbers, that limit can't exist. Can't possibly exist. It's because it's one value coming from the left, another value coming from the right. Can't happen. Right? All right, good deal. That's the analytical approach. Okay? Um, I think, let's see. Let me erase what I've done here. And any questions before we move on? Here's how they approach it. They do it graphically. So you could have chosen this if you wanted to. If you consider the graph of the function, you have to do the analytic part anyway. Uh, but it, notice they do the same thing we did. Um, the absolute value of x is x when x is greater than or equal to 0. It's minus x when x is less than 0. And then to divide x by x for positive values of x, notice they left off the equal sign just like we did. That gave you a 1. And when you put minus x over x, that gave you a minus 1. So here's what we've got. Functions approaching, uh, function value is negative 1 as you approach 0 from the left. It's positive 1 when you approach 0 from the right. And notice here, they left open circles at 0 because you have no clue what it is there. Yes? How do you come up with the one answer number? Uh, up there, that one? This one right here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for x greater than 0, which would be in this case, that would be x over x. Okay. x over x is 1. But minus x over x is minus 1. Yeah. So, when you don't know what it is. doesn't matter that you don't know what it, the value is at 0. The thing is, the limit is this approach is 0 from the left is minus 1. From the right is positive 1. That can't possibly exist. Yes? At the bottom, you said you didn't put the uh, uh, greater than equal to because um, you divide by yeah, you don't, it's an indeterminate form. Okay. That's why they left it off there. That's why they left it off here. Because you don't know the value of it. It's not ne negative 1. It's not positive 1. It's not determined. Now, because you, you still can't divide by 0. Okay. However, it's an indeterminate form. Yeah. Why is it negative? Like, wouldn't negative x turn to a positive x because it's the absolute value? Why does it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, you're absolutely right. When x is greater than 0, the value of absolute value is the same as x. Okay, and when it's less than 0, though, the value of this is a minus x. Because your x's are negative 17. Okay. Absolute value is 17, which is the opposite of negative 17. So that's a negative x. Then you put this function on top of this one, that would be a x over x, that's 1. Minus x over x, that's minus 1. Okay, when you plug the, this piecewise defined function here over this, you get two different values. Okay, now, so that's an example of a uh, function that has different left-hand behavior than it does right-hand behavior. And if they don't approach the same thing, they don't think the limit of that function, this function here, does not exist. Cannot exist. All right. Make sense? Okay. When you run into that function, that is not very often, but I just need to show you not all limits do exist. Okay. Now, they also did something else here. They set up a little interval for x given a delta greater than zero, this would be a delta, and that would be the opposite of delta, minus delta, okay? Because delta is always positive. This would give you a little window here. And no matter how wide or narrow you get it, it the values don't, don't match. There is no value you can get here. Now, you might say, what in the world, why did they introduce that? Coming up, they're going to give you a formal definition of a limit, and they'll introduce deltas then. So they went on and, and showed you now. What they haven't showed you is epsilon, okay? Epsilon 
is going to be on the y axis, okay? And deltas are going to be on the x axis. But don't sweat it too much yet. Uh, they just threw them out there, and I think the next slide will say something about them. No, no, it doesn't. So no matter how close x gets to zero, there'll be both a positive and a negative uh, x values that lead to f of x equal 1 from the left and negative 1 from the right. You can't ever get anything that even comes close to each other. Okay. So here's where they introduce the delta. This is a lowercase delta in the Greek alphabet, if you just noticed. Specifically, if delta, lower grace uh, Greek letter delta, is a positive number, then for x value satisfying the inequality, zero is less than the absolute value of x is less than delta, you can classify the values uh, of absolute value of x over x as minus one or plus one on the interval uh, from it's minus one from negative delta up to zero. Now notice, they don't include the delta, it doesn't really matter there, but they don't include zero, because you can't divide by zero. Still can't, even though it's an indeterminate form. This would be a negative one, that would be a positive one. No matter how small you get the delta, it, they never get any closer to being a valid entry. Okay? So, hang it up. So, they introduce the delta there. Later, we'll be talking about epsilons and deltas. Right now, they just introduce the delta. No matter how close you get to zero, not going. It's going to stay minus one on the left and positive one on the right. Okay. Because the absolute value of x divided by x approaches a different number from the right-hand side than it approaches from the left-hand side, the limit, which is repetitive here, the limit as x approaches zero does not exist. I'll put one value from the left, one from the different value from the right. As x gets closer and closer to zero, they stay minus one and plus one. At zero, that's not defined, but they uh, are indeterminate. But the limit stays minus one and one. one. Okay. Now they're skipping examples four and five. So let's go back. This will probably have, ah, that one's going to have the most space to write. Let's do example four. Okay. Discuss the existence of the limit. The limit as x approaches zero of 1 over x squared. Okay? That's a lot of loops in my M, but that's the limit. Okay. What can you say about this? My first suggestion is Glade. What do you do with Glade? Plug it in, plug it in. All right? All right. So what do you do if you plug in x equals 0 there? What do you get? Okay. That's not indeterminate, folks. That's undefined. 1 over 0 can happen, never can happen. There's nothing you can do to it to ever make it happen. That's an undefined point. Not indeterminate, undefined. That's not going to exist. That will never exist. You will not ever get an answer there. So that one... Uh, is that now they say consider the graph and the graph of that does something like this okay ne'er to twain to me they just keep on climbing never do they get anything close to an x equals zero they just get larger larger and larger larger from the left larger from the right but they don't reach any value at all that does not exist okay so anytime you get an undefined form, not indeterminate form, undefined form, hang it up. They will not, that limit will not exist. Okay? And they plug in a few values and let you see that. Okay? Now, 
this next one I find pretty obnoxious itself, but let's do it. And this one, by the way, on, if you haven't used these books before, I think you probably have. This author, Larson, now he's Larson and Edwards in your calculus text, okay? This author has inter internet resources at larsoncalculus.com. This is separate from WebAssign or anything like that you need codes for, you need to buy or something like that. These are free, absolutely free. You don't have to be in the course. You don't have to buy a book. You don't have to do it. Anyone could go to this website and find and read it. You know, it's just there. LarsonCalculus.com. It has interactive examples. Okay. It has videos explaining the concepts of calculus, three-dimensional graphs that can be viewed and rotate using this CDF player, whatever that is. Videos with Bruce Edwards, who's the second author. Okay. Uh, explaining proofs and theorems. Editable, now that's not edible, but editable, you can edit them, not eat them, spreadsheets of data sets in the text. So there's all sorts of stuff. I can tell uh, Andy back there is hungry. You know, you can't eat them. Okay, no, all right, do that. All right, so that's all at LarsonCalculus.com. There's also, on homework exercises, at the end of each section, all the odd number exercises have CalcChat.com. You can go to that website, absolutely free, no codes required, nothing required, and that offers you solution for the odd number exercises from the text. When the solutions are not enough, you can chat with an online tutor for live help. Amazing, okay? Now, some sections, I'll point these out as we get there, also are available at calcview.com. There'll be odd numbers, but not all of them. That presents video solutions of selected exercises, video solutions of selected exercises. The CalcChat.com just gives you the answers and with some description of how to get there. This is video solutions of selected exercises from the text, uh, and you can watch instructors progress step by step through the solutions, providing guidance to help you solve their selected exercise and others like it, blah, blah, blah. And they also have QR codes, you know, the little box with funny little symbols in it. Okay, you can just do your phone on that and, and pull it up directly that way, or go to calcview.com. Now, why did I do a pause there? Because example five, which you're about to do, you can go to larsoncalculus.com and see them talk about this too. Now, on the homework exercises, and we'll get to those later in the period, uh, what I suggest you do, I always assign odd number exercises. Why? Because their answers are in the back. So do that homework exercise, or at least some of them, Check your answers in the back. If you didn't get the right answer, see if you can figure out why you didn't get the right answer. However, if you can't figure that out, then calcchat.com is right there. You can go and see them work it out. Oh, that's what I did though. If it happens to be one that's a red letter one, then you can uh, also go to calcview.com and see more. Okay. So, let's do example five, which they don't do. And it says discuss the existence of the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 1 over x. Now what do you notice about that? Okay, 1 over x is undefined. Completely undefined. Okay, now as x goes closer and closer to zero, 1 over x gets incredibly large, just like that graph we saw before, okay? Uh, I should be going from this way, approaching zero from either side, okay? Uh, actually, 1 over x would be going negative here and positive here. But that really doesn't matter either because the sine of a number that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, what does the sine function do? stays between plus or minus 1, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 1. The bigger and bigger you get, stays between plus or minus 1. It oscillates between plus or minus 1. So how can you take the sign of a number that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger where the value of sign is just doing this? 
you know, and this, and this, and this, faster, 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 as you get close to zero from the left or the right. They're probably doing like this, but who cares? They're never approaching any limit, okay? No way, okay? But again, if you see an indeterminate form in the middle of another problem, it can't work either, okay? It cannot work, the indeterminate form. It doesn't matter if there's a sign in front of it. That just means it's safe to bounce it between plus and minus one. That doesn't exist, okay? The one over x doesn't exist, so the sign one over x doesn't. So you see it in the text. <clears throat> now, here's the bad news. If you had just chosen the wrong thing to look at, if you had just said, well, let's look at pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi. You look at those, they all have the same value. Okay, well, those will all be zero. So, so if you did pi halves, then that would give you something that would seem like it would always be the same. But in reality, and they show the examples, if you chose well, like x equal 2 over pi, so its reciprocal would be pi halves, and then 3 halves pi and 5 halves pi, you know, do each one of those, then you would be at plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. Then you see the limit doesn't exist. But the thing is, if you had just happened to choose a, a bad value for x, that would always be, say, 1. You say, oh, the limit's 1, okay? Because sine is a uh, periodic function, so if you chose the happened to choose the period that gave you one every time, you think the answer was one, okay? It's not, okay? So, uh, again, look at that form, indeterminate, I mean, not indeterminate, undefined, one over x, not defined, never will be defined. You could, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> basically hang it up. I just want to make sure y'all are awake. Hang it up and say that one doesn't exist. All right. Now, I think we're now ready for these common types of behavior associated with non-existence of the limit. Okay? The first one was the first example we did see. If the f of x approaches a different number from the right side of c, as, as you're approaching c, Okay, then it does approaching from the left side of C, then the, the limit will not exist. If F increases or decreases without bounds as X approaches C, that limit's not going to exist. Or if F oscillates between two fixed values as X approaches C, there's no way it's ever going to have a limit. Okay? So that was the third example. Saw sine of 1 over x. This would be 1 over x or 1 over x squared or anything that's undefined will be probably something like this. Sine of an undefined or cosine of an undefined will probably be that one and um, something like that's the value of x over x that approaches two different values from left and right. Those will not exist. So those are the ones kind of to watch out for most others you'll probably find. Now, why in the world would they come up with a function like this? But here's the next, oops, they left it off. Okay, I thought they were going to show this. I think in the other slide set they did. Here is, the, they say, in addition to f of x equals sine of 1 over x, which I find is ridiculous to look at in the first place. There are many other interesting functions that have unusual limit behavior. One often cited, and I don't know why they even came up with the function, is the Dirichlet or Dirichlet. I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, he's German, so I bet you it's Dirichlet. If he was French, it would be Dirichlet, but I think it's because he's German, Dirichlet. But I don't know that. Okay, uh, and here's what that function is. f of x is equal to, again, a piecewise defined function, 0 if x is rational, 
and 1 if x is irrational. Okay. Does that have a limit anywhere? For any value of c? Pick a c, any c. Pick a number. One. One. Okay. As as x is approaching c, approaching one from the left or right, your uh, at one, that would be f would be one. Uh, no zero because one is a rational number. Okay, but as you're approaching one, okay, if you're approaching one, there are infinitely many rational numbers, say between zero and one, but there's also infinitely many irrational numbers between zero and one. So it would just be you wouldn't be able to tell here's zeros here and one's there, okay? As you get closer and closer to one, yeah, you know the answer is going to be zero because one is, but it doesn't have a limit because, but what a stupid question in the first place. I mean, uh, but evidently this is, well, I'm sorry, are any of you math majors? Yes, okay. This would be something that math majors would probably eat up, you know, because, oh, this is an interesting concept here, but I see no practical application for any of something like that. So I'm a little, but that is another one that, because there's infinite, pick any two tiny, tiny ends of an interval here. You have an infinite number of rational numbers in between those two, an infinite number of irrational numbers. So it'd be just bouncing back and forth, up and down between zero and one. So it's not going to have a limit. So that's what they're talking about. Um, well, let's see. No, they're not going to do this. Here's another example of why that sine of 1 over x, we didn't have that, did we? No. Uh, sine of 1 over x, if you're using your graphing calculator to graph things, Remember, on a graphic calculator, you have to give intervals, right? Steps, okay? And most of the time, your calculator is going to connect the dots, okay? And if you did do that, and they call this a technology pitfall, it would look like there is a limit. It looks like it goes to zero as x goes to zero. This is the sine of 1 over x. But in reality, you're just picking a finite number of points. The computer isn't doing an infinite number, it's doing a finite number. No matter how close you get them, and they, you can, if, especially if it's in, I think they used to call it connect mode, that it connects the dots, it'll make it look like it does come to zero there. It's come down here, up here. It isn't. That's because you're connecting a finite number of dots. You've left out Humpteen tree hop that would just go back and forth like that, that happened in between these points. Because in between any interval, there's an infinite number of other numbers you can put in there. And they're not, and they're still doing this, plus or minus one. So they, they call that a technological pre, a technology pitfall. Makes it look like there's an answer, there's not. All right, now put on your tuxes. We're going to get to a formal definition of a limit, okay? So, let's take another look at the informal definition that we've been using so far. If f becomes arbitrarily close to a single number l as x approaches c from either side, then the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. As written here, the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to l. First glance, that looks fairly technical. The problem is it's still informal because what do we mean by arbitrarily close? That's a weasel word, okay? You don't, you, you need a better definition than that, okay? Uh, exact meaning have not been given to the two phrases becomes arbitrarily close to 
or X approaches. But how, do we, how does X approach? Okay. Now that to me is a little better, but though it becomes arbitrarily close. That's anytime you got a word like arbitrary in there or adverb like arbitrarily, then you, you may have a problem. X approaches, that looks a little more defined. But here's how we overcome that. The first person to assign a mathematically rigorous meaning to those two phrases was not Newton or Leibniz who developed calculus. It was this guy, Augustine Louis, I don't even know how to pronounce his last name, Cauchy, Cauchy, I don't know. Probably Cauchy, it's French. So I think that's how they would do it. His epsilon delta definition is the standard used today. All right. This figure, they don't give you what function they're talking about, but they give you a function that goes along like this, but then right here, smack dab, at C, we're not sure what the function value is. There's a hole in the graph there, okay? But does this function have a limit? Okay, well, from our old definition, as uh, x gets arbitrarily close to, uh, or x approaches c, then the function value gets arbitrarily close to this value l, so that function does exist. Well, how can we say that a little bit better? Okay, uh, in this figure, the epsilon is defines the range on the vertical axis, your function value, your L, that's going there, it's a small positive number. So L plus epsilon will be a little bit greater than L, L minus epsilon a little bit less than L. Now they've made it pretty big sized here, so you can zoom it in and in and in and make it as small as you want. Then the phrase is X becomes arbitrarily close to L, means that L, that X is F of X, the function value, is in the interval between L minus L, epsilon, and L plus epsilon there. So you can let epsilon be any number greater than zero and let it go to zero. So uh, that's how you do your arbitrarily close. Now, that's what the function is doing. What is the X doing? As x approaches c, that means there is a delta, another small positive value, that as long as the x is in between c minus delta and c plus delta, because delta is also a positive number, that you're going to be in this interval. So basically what you're saying, if you let your c, your x value, be within this band, the y value is guaranteed to be within that band. Okay? And you can get and let your delta get as small as you want, get the epsilon be as small as you want. If you can always guarantee this, then you have uh, this is the formal definition of a limit. Okay. So arbitrarily close approaches, still sort of use approach a little bit, but uh, that's what you got. Because you see right here, the epsilon delta definition of the limit as x approaches c. So they're still using that terminology. Okay. So using the absolute value, you can write this as, now usually where you begin, let epsilon be greater than zero. Any value greater than zero. Then, there exists a delta that's also greater than zero, such that for any um, value of epsilon, that the absolute value of f of x minus l. Now this means if you're above or below l, see if f of x is above l, this will be a positive number, less than a positive number. But if it's below l, then the absolute value makes this a positive number again, for that you can guarantee that f of x minus l, the absolute value of that, is less than epsilon. Uh, that's your uh, arbitrarily close phrase, similar to the phrase as x approaches c means there is a positive value delta 
such that x lies in the interval c minus delta to c or c to c plus delta. So somewhere in the range of that. Okay? Um, so that fact can be concisely expressed that 0 is less than or equal to the absolute value of x minus c is less than or equal. It's less than, not equal, less than delta. So as long as x is not c, uh, then x minus c is going to be bounded on the left by 0 or on the right by delta. And delta can be as small as you want, so this can be a tiny, tiny. So x can be approaching c as close as you want to get it, okay, for any delta, okay. Now, they haven't really phrased it well yet, so let's see. That first inequality of the one we just did is the distance between F and C is being more than zero, okay? And the distance between F and C, and this means X is not equal to C. Otherwise, this would be equal to zero, but it's not. The second inequality, uh, that X is within delta units of C says that X is with, within a certain distance of C. In other words, is approaching C. So this gives it, these two put together, give you the, uh, the phrase as X approaches C. As you choose delta to be as small as you want it to choose it. All right. This is a lot of blah, 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 I feel like. And unfortunately, you have to do it. Thank you, Koshis, for making us do all this. You're just as good as you just know that one. Let f be a function defined on an open interval c, except possibly at c. It may not be defined at c, but it's defined anywhere else in that interval except c. Okay? Then the statement that the limit as x approaches c of f of x equal to l. If that is a true statement, that means that for any epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small you make the epsilon, there's going to exist another delta greater than zero. The epsilon is called the y value. Uh, delta is on the left x-axis, such that um, zero less than the absolute value of x minus c less than delta. With this absolute value, you know you can do zero here because it can't ever be uh, negative. If this is true, then this will be true. The difference between L of X and L will be less than that. So any, for any delta you choose, any delta you choose, you can find an epsilon part. Actually, it usually works the other way. For any epsilon you choose, you can find a delta such that get close enough to see, you guarantee this is uh, the difference between this is epsilon. Okay. Now, this goes through all kinds of iterations, and really what you should do, like a lake, plug it in, okay? The limit as x approaches 3 of 2x minus 5, okay, what would that be? Plug it in. 2 times 3, 6 minus 5 is 1. Okay. Plug it in and see, no question. Okay. But to use a definition, you need to find the delta such that the difference between your alpha of x and your limit is less than, no, there's your tolerance, there's your epsilon, less than 0 0.01. Whenever the 0 is between x minus 3, x minus 3, the absolute value of x minus 3 is between 0 and delta. You need to find the delta that guarantees that's going to work. Okay? Now, to me, this almost seems like an exercise in futility, but it does work. Okay? So let's see. Let's take this. And this is absolute value of 2x minus 5 minus 1. You don't need that in parentheses there. Okay. 
Probably don't need that parenthesis either. This you want to guarantee to be less than 0 0.01. Okay? Well, what is this? This is the absolute value of 2x minus 6 less than 0 0.01. Well, factor out a 2. That would be the absolute value of 2 times x minus 3 is less than 0 0.01. Okay. Well, that 2 is always positive, so you can factor that out here. 2 times the absolute value of x minus 3, I'm leaving the parentheses aside, is less than 0 0.01. Now divide both sides by 2, and you get absolute value of x minus 3 is less than 0 0.005. There's your delta. If you choose an epsilon, say, I want to guarantee that I can be within 1 thousandth, no, 1 hundredth, of a of this value here, that this value is going to be within one hundred, then choose a delta that differs uh, the difference between x and three is going to be less than uh, a delta of point zero zero five. That will guarantee you to be within that tolerance. Okay. Now, if only they all work that easy. Okay. But you see, this one, you can just plug it in and get that answer. So there's, but this is how you find out what, given an epsilon greater than zero, you can find a delta greater than zero that guarantees it works. That's your formal definition of the limit. Okay. Now. Let me erase my scratch here and see if they do anything much differently from that. In this problem, you're working with a given value of epsilon, namely epsilon equal to 0 0.01. That's your epsilon right there because it's the difference between the function and the limit. That's going to be your epsilon. Okay? To find an appropriate delta, Try to establish a connection between the absolute values here and here. Okay? You've given an epsilon. Now see if you can find how that relates to a, a given delta. Well, this one is pretty easy to do because all you do is evaluate this function here. Or that, whoops, hit the wrong key. Notice that absolute value of 2x minus 5 minus 1, that's the function minus 1, is actually the same as the absolute value of 2x minus 6. Okay, so remove the parentheses and collect like terms. Well, that's the same as 2 times the absolute value of x minus 3. That's x. 2 can't ever be negative, but x minus 3 could, so leave that an absolute value. But then, if you know that needs to be less than 0 0.01, then... This is exactly the form that you're looking for, so divide that and you get 0 0.005. If only they were all that easy, okay? They won't be, I promise. That choice worked because now you found a delta, 0 0.005, that guarantees that any time the epsilon is less than equal to 0 0.01, that is guaranteed to work for you sort of seems like you're running in a circle, you know, and you kind of are, but that's what this goes for. As you can see from this figure, uh, for x values within 0 0.05 of 3, okay, that's a lot bigger than that, okay, okay, but no, this one works. Here's your box here. So if you're within 0 0.005 of 3, okay, because, uh, X was going approaching 3. So that would be from 0.2995 to 3.005. This is plus delta minus delta. Okay? It guarantees that your 
uh, function. Plug this value in your, uh, it's on the previous slide. Oh, here it is. Plug this in here and 2.995 here, you get 0.99 here. Plug in 3, you get 1. Plug in 3.00, then you get 1.01. You've shown that you guarantee that for an epsilon of 0, 1, plus or minus from 1, you can guarantee you get that as long as you use a delta less than 0 0.005. This difference here, no, no matter how small you want the epsilon to be, 0 0.00001, you can do the same thing and then you get the delta of the point here, the, 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 the bunch of those with the five answer there. One more zero and five. Okay. Now, remember this, x didn't have to have a value at first, but uh, as long as you're within this epsilon and that delta, your the difference between that would be you'll be approaching one. Okay. As X is approaching three, zero is one and is approaching one. Okay. Now. This is the part I like least about calculus. Give me integration, differentiation, all that kind of stuff. Go for it. It's the proving <laughs> when things are seem like they're intuitively obvious that you still have to prove it. Okay. Whoa. That was the last slide in the section. There are two more examples. And this is just like them. The easy one, they showed you. The two that are not going to be as simple, then you have to figure out those on your own. Okay. So let's go and see what we can do with this one. Okay. Example seven. And I don't want to spend too much time on it, but let's go for it. Oh, this one's going to be just as easy. Example 7 is. Okay. Use the epsilon defi delta definition of a limit to prove that the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x minus 2 is equal to 4. You know what my gut wants me to do? Plug it in. Okay. And do it. Plug in x equal 2 here. 3 times 2 is 6 minus 2 is 4. I'm happy with that. Okay. But they said using the epsilon delta definition, do it. Okay. So here's how you technically begin this. Okay. For me, if you plug it in and it works, you die. Okay? But here's using the definition. Here's how they use Y. For any epsilon greater than zero, or sometimes it's let epsilon be greater than zero. Either way you want to phrase that. Okay? Uh, then... This is how you start. Then there exists a delta greater than zero such that, I like to use the vertical line to mean such that, so I don't have to write such that, All right, except that looks like an absolute value symbol. So let me put such that. Okay. Okay. There is a delta greater than zero uh, such that for the absolute value, now here's where you put your function minus a limit, absolute value of 3x minus 2 minus 4 less than epsilon, okay? They put parentheses whenever um, x minus 2 
zero is less than that is less than this absolute value is less than delta okay there's what we're wanting to prove for any epsilon you choose any epsilon greater than zero there it will be a delta greater than zero such that the absolute value of the difference between the function and the limit will be less than zero whenever delta is the x minus 2 the x minus 2 the difference between the x and the value is approaching is less than delta okay now let's do very similar to what we did before let's combine like terms absolute value of 3x minus 6 less than epsilon okay now factor out the 3 absolute value x minus 2 less than epsilon okay well we want a form that looks like this so let's divide both of these by 3 and then you have this being your delta whatever epsilon you chose however small you chose it any epsilon greater than 0 0 0.0001 okay then for that small of an epsilon you can find the delta that would be 0 0.0001 divided by 3 when you plug that delta in here you guarantee that the function will, will be arbitrarily close to that limit. So, so that's how we did just like we did before only last time they gave us an epsilon 0 0.01 this says for any epsilon you choose no matter how tiny you, you make it divide it by three and there's your delta you just found the delta okay it seems sort of ludicrous but it works okay and that's all you have to do there's your delta okay now that's the i meant to ask you are you a georgia fan or just happen to have a shirt huh oh i see are you from georgia oh that's right yes thomasville georgia aren't you what's that are you from thomasville georgia uh, I'm oh. From, uh, Brunswick, Thomas oh i see okay all right well yeah i did my master's at georgia yeah right. you georgia? yeah but this is going to really disappoint you i did my undergraduate at georgia tech that's why I'm huh that's why I'm you're obnoxious you know okay <laughs> all right okay good deal now that was the easy one okay let's do example eight which is not quite so easy okay use the epsilon delta definition to prove that the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared anyone want to hazard a guess Second? Yeah, what's going to be the limit of that? Four. Absolutely. So why prove it? I mean, it's so intuitively obvious. Okay? But you must show that uh, let epsilon be greater than zero, then there exists a delta also greater than zero such that okay I probably shouldn't use that then there exists a delta such zero such that any time the absolute value of x squared minus four is less than epsilon whenever such that this is going to be true whenever um, zero is less than the absolute value of x minus two that's always what that is that's less than delta okay now unfortunately this 
there's not a form that you can just do something, divide out something, and get that. You can come close to it by doing this, noting that this is the absolute value of how, what can you do to this form here, x squared minus 4, to make it look something like that? Say again? Factor it, okay? And this would be what? Okay. Now, if this were a 7 or a 15 or whatever, you can factor it out. It's not. It's got a variable. I mean, your variable x is in there. So what you have to do in this case, I left off parentheses, didn't I? Okay. Um, so here's what you have to do here. Because this is that. Now, actually what they do, they also do this. They put absolute values there. The absolute value of x squared minus 4 is the absolute value of x plus 2 times the absolute value of x minus 2. The x minus 2 works great for this. The x plus 2 does not. Okay? So you're interested in values of x close to 2. So choose an x in the interval. So x is in the interval of 1 to 3. Okay? Any x in that interval from 1 to 3. Okay? All right. Now, when x is in that interval, 1 to 3, then you know your delta is going to be, see, if x is 1, that would be 1 minus 2 would be minus 1. Absolute value of that would be 1. If x was 3, that would be 3 minus 2. That would be 1. Absolute value of 1 is 1. Your delta here would be uh, 1. So anytime x is in this interval, then the uh, delta would be 1. Okay? Now, you let delta be less than 1. Okay. So guarantee it's going to be less. All right. So if x is in this interval, the x minus, or x plus 2, we're not messing with the x minus 2, that's over here, okay. x plus 2 is going to be in the interval from 3 to 5, right? If x is in the interval from 1 to 3, then x plus 2 would be x uh, 1 plus 2 would be 3, and 3 plus 2 would be 5. So x plus 2 would be in that interval. Okay. So obnoxious, okay. Uh, so if you let delta then be the minimum, okay, pick the larger of these. That's 5, right? So that's the greatest that this thing can be, you know. So that was going to then be 5 times the absolute value of x minus 2 less than epsilon, okay. Divide this by 5, and you have absolute value of x minus 2 less than epsilon over 5. Let that be your delta, okay? Uh, because now this part here is that, and this part here is that, so let epsilon minus uh, divided by 5 be that. Again, this feels like you're just running in circles for no real reason at all. All you had to do was plug in the 2, okay? But this is your formal definition. So you're for an epsilon, uh, for any epsilon greater than zero. If you pick a big epsilon greater than zero, five will probably do it for you, okay? Uh, but if you pick a really tiny one, then whatever you get, divide 
uh, epsilon bar phi, that will guarantee that this function will be within that. Because the x plus 2 can't be any more than, you know, if you chose this as a value, so if it's something greater than, if, if it's 5 or greater, then 5 will work for you. But if it's a very tiny number, then you go back and let that be your, your value. And again, it's kind of almost seeming ludicrous, okay? But it works, okay? Throughout this chapter, you'll use the epsilon delta definition of the limit primarily to prove theorems about limits and to establish the existence or non-existence of particular types of limits. For finding the limits, you'll learn techniques that are easier to use than the epsilon delta definition. Guess what we'll go for? Those techniques. All right, that finishes 2.2. Homework exercises here would include any of the odds 5 through 9. They're all at calcchat.com. You'll see that right at the top of that page. But number 5, because it's in red, is at calcview.com. And you can take your smartphone and read that QR code. It takes you right to that site. Or you can go to calcview.com and see that example. Okay, then do any of the odds 11 through 19. They're all at Calc Chat. None of those are at Calc View. Do number 21. It's at Calc Chat. Then do any of the odds 23 to 29. They're all at Calc Chat. 25 is at Calc View. Do 31. It's both at Calc Chat and Calc View. Do 33. It's both at Calc Chat and Calc View. Do 35. It's at Calc Chat. Then do any of the odds, no, either 37 or 39. They're both at Calc Chat. Then do any of the odds 41 to 45. They're all at Calc Chat. 43 is at Calc View. Do any of the odds 47 to 57. They're all at Calc Chat. 49 is at Calc View. Do 59. It's at Calc Chat. Should be. 61 should be at Calc Chat. And then. 63 should be at Calc Chat. Now, you can explore doing 65 or 67 if you're interested in those. I don't, they're probably going to be at Calc Chat. Check it out. 69 should be at Calc Chat and 71. Well, actually, you choose 71 or 73. They should be at Calc Chat. There's a couple of true false, 75 or 77. They should be at Calc Chat. You can try to do 79. It should be at Calc Chat. 81 indicates you need a graphing utility to try it. See if you can figure out without it. But if you do have a graphing uh, utility, be very careful that you don't run into one of those technological or technology, what do they call it, errors or, what was that, pitfalls, okay. Then 83, 85 are both proofs. You can do those if you want. Now the Putnam Challenge, those are always fairly difficult. I guess there's some sort of a Putnam contest or something that you can do. These are examples taken from that. You're never required to do those, only if you say, hey, this looks interesting, let me try that. All right, any questions on that? Any of those? Again, I don't really care for the formal definition that much, but do it if you need it. Okay, especially if you're doing proofs. All right, how are we doing? We've got eight minutes left, right? Okay, so let's move on to 2.3. Now, I don't have a, my watch on. The battery died, so you're going to have to let me know. As soon as I get off the screen, I don't see my time anymore. Okay, and I'm getting off the screen right now. 
Okay. So we're still in chapter two, limits and their properties. 2.3 is evaluating limits analytically. I like that a lot more than graphical, numerical, doing it analytically. Okay? And even formally. So what we're going to do, our objectives here, are evaluate a limit using the properties of limits. So obviously we've got to talk about what the properties of limits are. We'll develop and use a strategy for finding limits. We'll evaluate a limit using the dividing out technique, using rationalizing technique, and then the squeeze theorem, which is not one of my favorites either, but the others work quite, quite nicely. Okay. So let's first look at the properties of limits. The limit of f of x as x approaches c does not depend on the value of f at c. We already saw that a time or two. It may happen, however, that the limit is precisely f of c. Okay? And if it is, that's a real easy thing to do. So in such cases, you can evaluate that limit by direct substitution. Plug it in, plug it in. The limit of f of x as x approaches c, if you plug in x for that, you get it. That's your limit. Such well-behaved functions are continuous at c. There are no holes, gaps, missing values. They're continuous at C. So here's the theorem. Now this gives you a few. And we'll base use these to do many others. So let B and C be any two real numbers. Let N be a positive energy. B and C real numbers. Fractions, decimal, rational, ra irrational, uh, positive, negative, it doesn't matter. N, though, has to be a positive energy. 7, 14. Can't be negative 3, have to be positive, and a positive energy. Now, here's the first one. The limit as x approaches c of the number b is, guess what? The limit as x approaches c of the function f of x equal b Guess what it is? B. Now what? What is this function? F of x equal B. That's a horizontal line, isn't it? B units. Now B could be positive, negative, whatever, but this is, that function, F of x equal B, is a constant function. Right? Okay? And as x is approaching C, from here or from there or anything, if the F of x is always B, the limit is always B, never anything else. That's sort of a duh, okay, type limit, okay? Makes perfect sense. Now, this one, the limit of X as X approaches C. Now, this function is your identity function. And as X approaches C, guess what the function value is? F of X equal X y is equal to x, okay, then as x approaches c, well, as x approaches c of x is c, because it's, that's what it's approaching. So that one's another kind of duh, all right? Now, since we've got some duhs going on here, let's do this one. The limit as x approaches c of x raised to any positive integer, any positive integer. Now, since it's raised to any positive integer, you can evaluate that. That's a polynomial, right? Polynomials are defined everywhere. So this will have a value. Well, what value will it have? As x approaches c, it'll be c to the n. Plug it in, plug it in. Okay? Plug it in, plug it in. This one, there's nothing to plug in. That's always b. Okay. Now, with a little imagination, you'll see you just about have already defined limits for any polynomial function. Because any polynomial function, with you got a little bit to do yet to get there, it's going to be some combination of powers of x plus linear function of x plus a constant function. Doesn't depend on x at all. That's going to pretty much fix any polynomial you'll ever want to have. Okay? So, 
This drives me nuts. They should have said this. What's the limit as x approaches 2 of 3? Three, of course, because the function's always three. No matter x approaching two, the x approaching seven million four hundred eighty-five pi, it's always going to be three. Okay, that one will be that. Okay, I'm going to see if I can cover these. Okay, this one. What's the limit as x approaches negative four of x? Negative four, of course. Okay, and this. One. What's the limit? as x approaches 2 of x squared. We've already done that one, haven't we? What was it? As x approaches 2, what's the limit of x squared? 2 squared, which is 4. 2 squared. Oh, they didn't write down 4, but now they will. In case they told you this part, you can do that part. Okay. You, thank you for having such faith in us. Okay. Any questions so far? Let's see if there's a D. No, there's not. Okay. How are we doing on time? Second? One more minute. Okay, let's see if we can give these properties of limits. Let B and C, again, be any real numbers, and any positive integer, F and G be functions with the limits, that the limit as X approaches C of F of X is L, and the limit as X approaches C of G of X is K. All right. So far, we haven't used the B, we've only used the C. Okay. Here's a scalar multiple. These are properties of limit. The limit as x approaches C of sub B, there's your B, of times f of x, is simply pull the B outside this, and that be the B times the limit as x approaches C of f of x, but that is L, so this would be B times L. So in other words, if you got a limit, of a function, you know it, and then you multiply that function by a constant, pull out the constant here, you pull out the constant there. Okay? Some are different. The limit as x approaches c of f of x plus or minus g of x would be the limit of, okay, let me say this this way. The limit of the sum of the difference is the sum of the difference of the limits. Okay? That's the shorthand way of saying it. The limit as x approaches c of a sum or a difference is the sum or a difference of their limits. The product, the limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x, the limit of a product of two functions is the product of the limit of those two functions. So there's the limit of that, f and the limit of that. The limit of a quotient of two functions, f divided by g, would be the quotient of their limits as long as that denominator is not zero. Okay. That denominator is zero, not going to happen. Unless, of course, the alpha of x is zero, and then it may be a determinant. Okay, the power function, the limit as x approaches c of some function raised to a power would be the limit of that function raised to that power. So those are your properties of limits. Okay. That got us to the bottom of page 83. We will start with example two next time. Okay, because I think we are out of time now, right? Yes. Okay. Ran over? Too bad. There'll be no extra charge. So. Okay. So we'll begin with example two. All right. Good deal, folks. Okay. Actually have it set up. And we'll see you. Boy, we got to quit having one day, one day a week classes. We got to have two days a week. Okay. So see if you can.